All right, welcome back to the ED exam video VAQ answers. So this is the answer to VAQ 8. We're just going to jump straight into it. So the first part of the question says describe and interpret the ECG. It's clearly a patient who's quite sick and unwell, probably in cardiogenic shock. Uh, so the rate is about 150 beats per minute, which you can see it's about two big squares on the rhythm strip. Another way you can calculate the rate is to calculate uh, 1500 divided by the number of small squares between the two complexes and that will give you a rough estimate as well and if you map it out it's actually dead regular so you've got a regular narrow complex tachycardia it's a bit hard to see P waves before every QRS you can see them in some places like here there's a P wave there might be P waves there in these leads it's very hard I can't see a P before every QRS so uh, there's a few different differentials in it. Might just be a sinus tachycardia, and because of the wonkiness of the baseline here and here, you can't see the P waves. If you can see P waves that are of three different morphologies, which I struggle to do, you've got to think about potential mul uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia. And if not, then that makes it an SVT. You can get little um, P waves popping up in things like an AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. So that's a differential, and I guess also think atrial flutter with a rate of 150. You normally see flutter waves best in V1, but again, this, this mm, hard to say. I don't think that's quite the sawtooth pattern, and then often in the inferior leads, again, that doesn't really look like flutter. If you see the rate of 150, though, that's part, obviously part of the differential, uh, and clearly it's not AF. The PR interval, where it's visible, is not lengthened and the QRS complexes are narrow. Of course the striking abnormality, you may have just jumped straight to this, is, is the ST elevation in the anterior leads. It's more than 2 millimeters, and it meets reperfusion criteria. There's also a reciprocal ST depression in the inferior leads in 2, 3 and AVF. Uh, so that uh, confirms that it's an anterior STEMI. A critical point, which is a sort of a hot topic in the literature at the moment, and those of you who are astute will have also noticed that there's ST elevation in AVR. This is predictive of a proximal left main coronary or LAD occlusion. And in this case, there's a 1.5 to 2 millimetres of ST elevation in AVR. That's predictive of a, anywhere from a 25 to about a 70% mortality. So in conclusion, I think you need to state emphatically this this is a life-threatening ECG. There's a left main or proximal LAD occlusion causing an anterior AMI with these big ST elevations here and uh, there's a possible subsequent arrhythmia related to that because it might be an SVT and cardiogenic shock and it mandates immediate reperfusion. All right, so we'll move on to the management now. Of course, this is a uh, critical cardiac emergency or a life-threatening cardiac emergency is a good uh, way to describe it. The patient's having a large infarct and is uh, pre-arrest, really. They're in cardiogenic shock, doing very poorly, and they've probably got little or no left ventricular function. So you start your management with, you know, you move to resus, large bore IVs, full monitoring, team approach, blah, blah, blah. As far as the A's and B's go, of course you want to apply oxygen, either high flow, ideally in this case what we actually did was put him on CPAP with 100% oxygen. You want to get as much, as much oxygen in to the myocardium as possible and just be cautious because putting CPAP on someone who's already hypotensive, that's ideal if they're sitting up uh, for that and it's going to drop his blood pressure a bit more. So as long as you highlight that, I think it'll be okay. And this is going to become a bit of a critical issue in the next part of the management. All right, now moving on to the management of the circulation. And this is the really the crux of the question here. And this was a real case I had a couple of weeks ago. And this caused a lot of controversy. So I think people are going to argue about uh, priorities and which order you do these things. But clearly a patient needs all three of these things to manage their circulation. Of course, thrombolysis is essential. You want to reopen the uh, culprit vessel and try and restore reperfusion to the myocardium. The patient's clearly going to need inotropes. So having a large left ventricular infarct, their myocardium's stuffed, they need uh, some sort of inotrope support, and we chose, in this case, adrenaline, um, because it's a cardiac 
stimulant mainly. Uh, and of course, you, this guy's going to need to be intubated for two reasons. One, because he was in APO and um, hypoxic, because we couldn't actually record his SATs. So he needed to uh, have that. And he was also getting quite delirious and agitated at this point because he wasn't perfusing his brain very well. And the other issue with intubating these patients is just to decrease his overall work and metabolic demand uh, because he's really on the razor's edge here and you really need to remove as much energy consumption from the rest of his body as possible to save his heart. So I'm not fussed what order you put these in and people, I'm sure people will argue about what's the correct sequence. Um, as long as you put all three, I think it's important. Some discussion points about this are that ideally before you go and intubate this guy, you want to get his blood pressure up uh, because giving him drugs with a systolic of 60 is going to crash him out. That's a wrong, the wrong thing to do. The, your choice of induction drugs is critical if you did mention it. You want to try and not drop his blood pressure if you're going to give drugs. And ideally you want to use something that's, you know, in inverted commas, cardiac stable. We chose fentanyl. And uh, I think we gave him a whiff of Midaz as well. However, we did not intubate him until we'd thrombolized him and put him on inotropes first. So we actually did it in this order. The, actually, the thrombolysis and the inotropes were fairly simultaneous. But, um, uh, yeah, there was... An, interestingly, we had ICU and the cardiology consultants there and me, and there was a lot of kind of toing and froing about what was the right sequence to do things. Uh, of course, as long as you're nascent of the fact that once you thrombolize someone and then you go to intubate them, so if you thrombolize and then you intubate them, you've also got this risk of bleeding into the airway, which uh, in my case was very interesting because... I was quite happy to exceed control of this case to the cardiologist and the intensivists who were in the room with me because this guy was really sick. He was obviously going to be under their care for the next week or two and uh, I wanted them actively involved. And when it came to intubate the patient, I said to them, oh, would you like to do it? And they handed me the laryngoscope and said, oh, no, nah. oh, you can do it. That's all right. So they, uh, they wanted the ED sucker to take on the risk of the potentially bleeding airway. Luckily for... My patient in real life, that didn't happen, but it's really important to, uh, uh, an important point to, uh, to keep in mind. So as long as you put these three, these three things down, they're the critical management points for circulation. And of course, the last bit of management is uh, supportive care and disposition. So su supportive care is your management of the intubated patient. You need to have a quick little checklist you can bang out for that. Things like uh, manager management of temperature, glucose control, fluid balance, uh, indwelling catheter, sedation and paralysis. You should be able to bang those out quickly. And of course, this guy's going to ICU, isn't he? And preferably, he's going to be transferred to a large cardiac centre as soon as possible. All right, this is just a quick little discussion about anterior STEMIs. Of course, this is the worst type of STEMI you can have. Uh, so you're diagnosed on the ECG by ST elevation, plus or minus Q waves in V1 to V6. ST elevation in lead 1 and AVL, and inferior reciprocal changes. Uh, this indicates a uh, LAD occlusion. They call this vessel the widow maker. Carries the worst prognosis, the largest infarct size, has a higher mortality, higher rates of CCF, and uh, lowest ejection fraction of all your infarct uh, kinds. And lastly, this is a bit of a hot topic in emergency medicine at the moment. We'll just a quick talk about ST elevation in AVR. If you haven't read about this, you need to look up Dr. Smith's ECG blog and uh, Life in the Fast Lane has a great article about it as well. Uh, it's a bit of a hot topic. A lot of the cardiologists and cardiology regs aren't totally au okay fait with it and it's something you need to know about. ST elevation greater than a millimetre in AVR indicates an LAD occlusion. Uh, the higher the ST elevation, the higher the mortality. So more than half a millimetre means uh, about a four times increase mortality. Greater than or equal to one millimetre of ST elevation in AVR, six to seven times mortality. Greater than 1.5 millimetres ST elevation in AVR means, you know, 
flirting with death, very, very high mortality. It indicates a proximal LAD occlusion or a left main coronary occlusion. Alternatively, it can also just indicate severe, severe triple vessel disease and the patient is going to need CAGS. It predicts the need for uh, cardi, uh, cardiac bypass surgery. So there you go. That's the answer to VAQ number 8. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to get in touch with me, just check out the website, www.edexam.com.au. You can tweet me at edexam, or you can send me an email, andy at edexam.com.au. Please feel free to leave a comment on the site, uh, on the main page on the site where I post the video, and I look forward, forward to hearing your feedback. For those of you doing the fellowship exam coming up in a couple of weeks, good luck. I hope you kill it, crush it, do really well, and uh, we'll get some tips on the upcoming clinical exam for when you get through the writtens. Cheers. All the best. We'll see you next time.